does any or how many people in this room feel that as human beings they're actually inferior to David Rockefeller or to Bill Gates? Please raise your hands if you feel you're inferior as human beings, not in terms of money, but as human beings. So we have one inferior feeling person. A uh, two, okay. <laughs> well, I for one do not feel I'm in any way, shape, or form inferior to David Rockefeller or Bill Gates. But I can tell you something, they sure feel that we, all of us, are inferior. In fact, 99% of the human race, they would like to turn into robots and drones and work us to death and then throw us away because they come out of a worldview or an outlook that motiv me, motivated me some seven, eight years ago to begin the research for a book on genetic manipulation of organisms, GMO in English. The, my project began, I had written a book some years ago before on oil called A Century of War, Anglo-American Oil Politics which went from the, essentially from the 1880s up through the Iraq War. And I was reflecting on what to write as a follow-up book. And a Croatian friend of mine who started a pub, her own publishing house in Zagreb pleaded with me to write a book about GMO. And I said, well, that's one of two or three topics that I've been considering. And if there's a real debate in Croatia about GMO, because the US State Department was trying to push Croatia, which has wonderful soil and water and agriculture, natural agriculture, to adopt patented seeds, then I said, I will write the book for you. And I did that. It was first published in Croatia kind of an unusual circumstance, but it, it was published there first. And then I went on to find an English language publisher. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, an English language publisher in Canada who had the courage to bring the book out. And from there, it's been published now in, I believe, 13 or perhaps with the Swedish 14 foreign language translations including Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Turkish, Russian, German, of course, where I live. But the point is not to talk about where my book has been published. I want to talk about what the content is about GMO and why this is one of the most dangerous threats to life on this planet, among many dangerous threats. And this is no exaggeration. The what motivated me to dig much, much deeper than a book simply about the health effects of GMO on, on humans and animals, because there are other books out there that go into great detail about that, and they were out there back then. My book discuss, discusses the politics behind the idea to patent life with a patent and a license that then could be enforced in the courts of law of the world and in the World Trade Organization tribunals. And I realized that I had to write a book about the hidden agenda, as it's called in English, of GMO, for the very simple fact that I realized in my research that four transnational corporations, three of them American, not that that inherently makes a company bad or good, but three of them American, and all three of them involved since World War I in secret contracts with the Pentagon or the War Department, as it was called then, secret contracts for chemical warfare production. They were involved in the production of Agent Orange, defoliant that was used in Vietnam, and had horrendous effects on the population, as well as America's own soldiers in Vietnam. They 
developed and marketed dioxin, which had horrendous carcinogenic effects on people who came in contact. DDT, which has been banned in most countries, but the wonderful charitable American chemical companies decide to sell it to the unaware third world still today. And those three companies are Monsanto Corporation, which started life in the 1914 as a chemical company, providing chemicals for the US uh, military. DuPont Chemical, which similarly owed its, its prominence to J.P. Morgan and World War I contracts for munitions, and Dow Chemical in Midland, Michigan. And were it to be one of the most healthy developments in human nutrition ever discovered by science, and were it to increase the yield per hectare of farmers around the world so that we could adequately feed a population of perhaps 10 billions, which may or may not uh, be the case at the rate the world is going here in the next 50 years, I would still, with all my energy, be opposed to GMO for the simple fact that allowing the patenting of life of the essential food stock of this planet, of the human race and the animal kingdom, and putting those patented rights in the hands of three or four private corporations, three of whom have the history of lying to the public, lying to their own employees, and creating fraud and manipulation, as well as these weapons that I mentioned, Agent Orange, etc. That power in those hands, private hands, without any control mechanisms would be enough for me to write this book. But there's actually much more, and I want to touch on a few aspects of that tonight. The family that I'm going to mention quite a number of times in this brief uh, talk tonight is a family that most people know associated with oil and control of oil. It's the family called Rockefeller, an American family. And after World War II, four brothers Rockefeller, David Rockefeller, who was the banker of the family, John D. Rockefeller III, who was interested in Japan and Asia, he created the Asia Society, financed by Rockefeller money, and as well, he created in 1953 the Population Council because he was interested in reducing world population. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller, who was the political person of the, fa of the family, he became governor of New York and later vice president. His lifelong obsession was to become president. And uh, Lawrence Rockefeller, the less, least known of the four brothers, they literally, after the world, world War II and emergence of the United States as the hegemonic power in the world, they literally divided the world among themselves. And they, in 1953, the Rockefeller Foundation gave a grant to Harvard University one of the elite universities in the United States, to Harvard Business School, in fact. And two professors at the Business School of Harvard were instructed to develop a model of the vertical integration of food production in America that would be similar to what the Rockefellers had done with oil. In other words, create a total control system, a pyramid of of control of the food system. And that's precisely what began first in the United States in the 50s. It went from frozen orange juice from Florida to chickens, chicken production. And from there, it went in the late 70s and the 80s into the industrialization of livestock production, cattle, and uh, 
cattle and pigs into what they called, they invented the term at Harvard called agribusiness. And the focus of their project was that the production of food, the most essential element of life other than oxygen and water, should be a for-profit only enterprise controlled by a handful of monopoly organizations such that today in America, in the United States, there are four giant companies that control the entire production of chicken meat in our grocery stores. Tyson Foods of Arkansas, who were quite influential in the Clinton presidency and very powerful in Washington today. Uh, Purdue Chickens from Maryland. Three or four giant corporations handle all the beef cattle and dairy cattle uh, raising and slaughtering. And so on down the entire food chain. Well, that allowed the production of meat in the United States. And this all took place during the 1980s when I was living still in New York. Uh, the late 1970s, 1980s, American agriculture began to be transformed. My grandfather came, his family came from Norway, and he grew up in North Dakota as a farmer, later a populist newspaper editor for the Nonpartisan League, which was a political organization that has been entirely erased from American history books. To my mind as an historian, political historian, it was probably one of the most unique populist organizations in the United States, which is why its history has been erased. They won the political control of the state of North Dakota. They worked with Charles Lindbergh Sr., the congressman from Minnesota, who wrote books against the money trust, the Wall Street banks in the 1920s. And they managed to get a senator elected in the United States Senate who introduced a bill during the Great Depression to abolish the privately owned American Federal Reserve Bank and put those powers back into the elected Congress where it belongs by the Constitution. Well, the American farmer was the backbone of the most positive spirit of the United States up until the 1970s, 1980s. And what happened through deliberate policy through the US government subsidy programs and other things, American farmers went into debt, into huge debt indebtedness, simply to survive in the marketplace that was being manipulated by the grain cartel companies, Cargill, Archer Daniel, Midland, Bungie, and so forth. And they were offered a way out of the debt prison beginning the early 1990s by the US Department of Agriculture uh, Advisory Services, they were encouraged to buy patented seeds by a company called Monsanto. DuPont and Dow were also involved, but Monsanto was the, the first in a big way. And they were told that this would increase their harvest yields so they could make more profit per acre or hectare, and that it would lessen the amount that they had to spend on chemicals to kill the weeds that grew up in the fields. So Roundup, or rather Monsanto began marketing something called Roundup Ready Soybeans. America is the world's biggest soybean producer. And the soybeans were used in cattle feed, in pig feed, because it's high protein. And then they started marketing genetic GMO corn. So the big agribusiness companies would mix corn and soybeans as power feed, because it's intensely high protein, power feed for animals, farm animals. Then gradually, Monsanto GMO swept across the United States like prairie fire. The only problem is farmers have to sign a contract with Monsanto that they only buy the matched chemical called Roundup 
It's the most widely used weed killer in the world today and probably the most poisonous, toxic. But Monsanto claims it's harmless. Uh, you can almost drink it. They don't say that quite so extremely, but they completely downplay the risks. And so GMO began to spread across the United States. But before I, I go into some of the aspects of that transformation of American agriculture, I want to go into the background of the people who gave the research dollars to develop genetically modified organisms, GMO plants. And Dolly the Sheep also is a GMO project. And that is a foundation with the name Rockefeller Foundation. Well, the Rockefellers came out of a tradition going back to the 1920s when they, shortly after they established their tax-free foundation to create a better image of, of the family after they ordered uh, striking workers in the copper mine in Colorado in 1913 to be shot and killed for trying to organize a trade union. That didn't go down well in the American press. We still had a relatively outspoken media back in those days, not, not like today. So John D., the old man, John D. Rockefeller, was advised to get a better public image. So he hired a public image maker, a spin doctor. And they suggested developing a foundation. Of course, it was tax-free. So the billions and tens of billions of dollars of money from Standard Oil and different Rockefeller companies could get away from taxation. At the same time, an income tax on ordinary Americans was introduced in 1913. So they were one of the main financial angels of something called the American Eugenics Society. For those, I hope I don't unplug this. For those of you who may not know what eugenics is, eugenics came out of the late 19th century. It came first out of, out of Britain and then spread quickly to the United States and other countries. It's the idea of race science. And uh, the best known example of this race science was the example in Germany in the 1920s and up until through the Second World War at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin and also the Kaiser Wilhelm in Munich, there were experiments done on human beings. These were people who were not of a high mental IQ. Often they were very poor people, so uh, they could be experimented on and there would be no public outcry because it wouldn't uh, become known. People like Josef Mengele, Dr. Death, the Nazi doctors of the Hitler uh, atrocities were involved in these eugenics experiments for the simple reason that the Nazis wanted to create a master race, the Aryan race, and also they wanted to kill off or eliminate the inferior species or peoples. So they did forced sterilization and other wonderful things to people they designated as inferior. And the money for the Nazi eugenics programs, research, and so forth, right up until 1939 and the outbreak of the Second World War, came from, can anybody guess? The Rockefeller Foundation. And this is documented. Uh, there are files on this, records on this. The family is not at all happy to have this uh, mentioned, as you can imagine. But the leading circles around the Rockefeller family who were involved in the, as officers and heads of the American Eugenic Society, where the 
Rockefellers were the major financial contributors. They came over to Nazi Germany and came back with a report to the eugenics group. The Nazis in Germany are doing what we only talk about doing here in the United States. We should put our money where our mouth is and copy the Nazis. It's a pity they have such a bad press image. That was the Rockefeller Circle's view of Nazi eugenics. Well, everything the Rockefeller family has done since about 1938 has been focused on finding a way to control life, to play with human gene structures. And in 1947, shortly after the Nuremberg trials and the revelation to the world of the uh, extermination camps that the Nazis ran, the American eugenics president at their annual meeting announced from today on the new name of eugenics will be genetics. All genetic engineering research is based on eugenics. The Human Genome Project, which included in its original directorate of scientists, a former Nazi doctor who was brought over by the Rockefeller family after the war and sanitized, all of microbiology is based on a discipline that was created artificially by grant money from the Rockefeller Foundation in 1938 called molecular biology. And it was an outgrowth of their eugenics with a very simple premise. If we can take life, the complexity of life, and reduce it to a single DNA, a genetic structure, and we can then play around with that genetic structure, potentially perhaps we can create the master race and we can eliminate the inferior races. And Rockefeller money, this is what really drove me to uh, dig deeper in the research on the book, Rockefeller money financed the first major GMO project in the Philippines in the 1970s at an institute that the Rockefellers created called the International Rice Research Institute. And their idea is, I can imagine, because uh, rice is the basic food stock of most of the world's population, which happens to be in Asia. Their dream was if we can manipulate the genetic structure of rice and sell it to the Asians as a great positive, we can control the seed supply. This is the key thing. This is a military strategy. We can control the seed supply of the majority of the human population, China, India, uh, all, of, all of Asia. So they began a project to develop GMO rice and they said, well, we need a, a selling point, a USP as they call it nowadays, unique selling point. So their spin doctors came up with the idea that it would prevent vitamin A deficiency in newborn children. And in their experiments, the rice, you know that rice is normally white unless you have certain varieties of wild rice, but rice is generally white basmati rice and all these. Well, their GMO rice turned out a very sickly, excuse me, urine colored yellow. And they said, oh, how are we going to market this? People are going to think it's, it's rotten or something. So the spin doctors came to the rescue and they said, we'll call it golden rice. Wow, people love gold. So uh, they called it golden rice and they said this you can still, online, you can find the speech of the British, current British agriculture and uh, food minister, who about seven months ago made the claim that uh, GMO is needed in the world to stop vitamin A deficiency in, in uh, newborn infants and various other things that were completely fraudulent. 
And so they started plans to market golden rice to the countries of Asia. Of course, they would, farmers would have to saw, sign contracts and, uh, and so forth and buy the seeds from Monsanto and co. But then an Indian biologist managed to get a hold of some of this from friends in the, in the Philippines, took it to a lab and had it tested. And the lab results came back that a newborn infant fed uh, golden rice would have to eat or consume eight kilograms per day to get enough vitamin A to combat the deficiency. And she also uh, determined that you could get through a natural diet, which is readily available in the developing world, without or, uh, chemicals and herbicides and so forth, uh, that you could more than adequately get enough vitamin A. So that kind of put the Golden Rice Project in the back burner. But Monsanto was undeterred. They went on to develop a bovine growth hormone for dairy cattle, for milk cows, recombinant bovine growth hormone, it's called, Prosoluc. And they began marketing that to American farmers in the early 90s. They said, hey, you guys, we've got something that's really hot here. If you give this to your cows, give them a shot of this stuff, they're milk volumes will increase on average by 30%. Wow. No farmer in those difficult days could afford to turn a blind eye to that. So bovine growth hormone from Monsanto spread like wildfire among American dairy farmers. Until reports started surfacing, farmers exchanged information on before the days of Facebook and Twitter on, uh, by email to other farmers. Their cows collapsed in the, in the stalls or in the fields. Their legs, their bones became brittle. Their legs could no longer support their body weight. They developed grotesque organic damage, horrendous things. They died much earlier than normal cows. So ultimately, the Monsanto bovine growth hormone found less and less a receptive audience among American farmers. So Monsanto turned and started spreading it to the developing world where they count on the fact that people are more ignorant than they are in the uh, North. And then something political happened that changed the entire landscape of GMO. In 1992, the President of the United States, a man by the name of George Herbert Walker Bush, had a, excuse me, just move a little bit here for the microphone, had a meeting, a closed door meeting in the White House with the top executives from Monsanto in St. Louis. And they worked out a strategy for global marketing of GMO, not only in the United States to American farmers, but around the world. And they convinced President Bush Sr that he issued an order that no government agency is allowed to test the health and safety issues related to GMO seeds, that those seeds should be accepted as what was called substantially equivalent to normal non-GMO corn or soybeans or cotton later. Well, there's only one problem with that if, if you're Looking at the words, it's a linguistic trick. And it's a contradiction in terms, because if something is equivalent, if A is equivalent to B, you all know from uh, grade school mathematics, it's equivalent. It's 100% equal to equivalent triangles. They match on every point. But substantial does not mean 100% equivalent. It means roughly. Well, Monsanto and company got a ruling from a corrupt Supreme Court in the United States that they could have a 
patent on their GMO seeds. They could patent them as unique, different from normal corn or normal soybeans because they had genetically altered the DNA of that corn by shooting it with a gene cannon of a foreign substance, bacteria or other different things. Therefore, it was unique and they could enjoy a patent on that and exclusive rights. Well, if it's unique, how can it be just the same as non-patented corn? So they have it both ways. When it's convenient for them, it's substantially equivalent and no government agency can be allowed to test it independently. The tests of all GMO consumed in the United States today, 20 years later, are provided by Monsanto themselves through testing agencies that they hire and there are examples that have come to the public light that whistleblowers in these testing agencies have admitted that they were told by Monsanto to change, to fake the results of their tests when rats died or developed cancer tumors so that it would look harmless. Not only that, Bush made sure because of the substantial equivalence, there's no need to label food that contains GMO. No labeling. You, you, you can't go to the supermarket in America and read what you're eating. So there's no labeling and there's no testing. And yet today, almost all of the meat that's in supermarkets across America is fed with GMO soybeans and GMO corn. That includes chickens, pigs, cows, you name it. And nobody knows about it until very recently. Nobody was aware of that because of this law. Every president since George Herbert Walker Bush in 1992 has continued that tradition. Monsanto, the vice president of Monsanto today determines policy on GMO and other things at the Food and Drug Administration of Barack Obama. His name is Michael Taylor. You can look it up. Well, there's something going on here that's extraordinary. This is not merely, as I concluded, this is not merely corporate greed, corporate profit that's driving Monsanto. It's certainly not humanitarian concern for malnutrition and feeding mankind. There's no GMO plant existing in the world today that has been genetically modified to grow more corn per hectare or any other plant. All of the largest commercial GMO plants have been modified to do one thing. Roundup Ready soybeans of Monsanto have been genetically modified to be resistant to the toxic poison weed killer of Monsanto called Roundup. It's ready to receive Roundup, that's all. And the toxic weed killer of, of uh, Roundup is by contract, farmers who buy the seeds have to buy that weed killer. They have no alternative. If they violate that, Monsanto has an army of lawyers that will sue that farmer in court and bankrupt him. And they've done it many, many times. So if this thing, as people like Bill Gates, who I told was recently in Sweden, preaching the glories of genetic manipulation, if this stuff is really so wonderful for mankind, and you can read it on the websites of Monsanto and other places, why do they have to be so damn underhanded to push this on the world's population? Why do they have to re resort to lies and other things? Well. I maintain, and I develop the case for this in the book, and I'll touch on a few points on that tonight, that this is part of the one, one of the most horrendous inhuman experiments uh, in, in, in history, perhaps. And that is to find a way to reduce global population dramatically over the next decades. It's premised on the fact that the world eventually capitulates and allows 
GMO seeds to be planted in China. In India, they've already done this and re realized to their horror what a disaster it is, and they're trying to reverse it. Uh, in Argentina, Monsanto and the Rockefeller family managed, together with the Bush family, managed to get the corrupt President Carlos Menem in the early 90s to give Monsanto an exclusive license in Argentina to plant Monsanto GMO soybeans. Today, almost 100% of American U.S. soybeans, almost 100% of Argentina soybeans, and well over 65 or 70 percent of Brazil soybeans, the three largest soybean producers in the world, are GMO. That means when you go to a natural food store and buy or go to any store, a Chinese restaurant, and eat food with these uh, soybeans on them, you're eating GMO. You're eating something that's been doused in Roundup weed killer. And the effects of Roundup weed killer, according to biologists, scientists in France, who have been viciously attacked by Monsanto because of this, they create cancer tumors in rats. They create liver diseases and distortions. They create early death or infertility. And those results are being kept from the world by Monsanto and the US government. What, what is the role of the U.S. government in this? What is their interest? Well, it's not simply helping good old American farmers. Those days are long gone. The U.S. government has been, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, has been a witting and willing partner in the worldwide proliferation of GMO seeds in different countries. And it goes back to something that Henry Kissinger, when he was National Security Council Director for President Nixon in the 1970s, and also Secretary of State later. Henry Kissinger was commissioned by Nixon to do a top secret study. It was published under the code name NSSM 200. I go into this in the book in some detail. NSSM means National Security Study Memorandum. And it was on population control and national security. Kissinger made an argument, and this was circulated to the CIA, to the State Department, to the Defense Department, and of course to the White House. He made the argument that there were 13 nations around the world which are rich in strategic raw materials, whether it was oil or minerals, rare earth and others. And those 13 nations also had extremely, for Kissinger and his friends, extremely high population growth rates. They were having too many babies in, in the minds of Henry Kissinger and friends. So it became official US foreign policy in 1974. The Freedom of Information Act files on this were only declassified in 1991 or 1990, I believe, when a Catholic Church lay organization filed a successful petition to have it declassified. The US government's secret foreign policy was to not give US Agency for International Development Aid, or Development Aid, to any developing country struggling along, if they had a famine like many countries in Africa were having back then, uh, drought, whatever, uh, that no aid would be given by the United States government unless that government in the third world had a population control policy in place. And the US State Department sent advisors to tell them what that population control policy would be. Well, in the 1950s, the Rockefeller brothers did human experiments on population control in Puerto Rico, an island then essentially a colony of the United States, but with no statehood. So it was kind of a no man's land where 
you could get away literally with murders, which is what they did in some cases. And they conducted sterilization experiments on Puerto Rican women when they, they encouraged them to go to uh, village clinics that were uh, built by Rockefeller money and US government money throughout the island. And the women were told it's much safer for your baby that it's, it's born uh, in a clean way in a clinic. And what the mothers were not told is that the doctors trained by Rockefeller and Co. would convince them to have a C-section, cesarean birth, for the health of the child, and then secretly tie their tubes so they could have no more kids. They did a similar thing in Brazil until it came into the public light. So when I say GMO is a project of the Rockefellers, eugenics is a lifelong obsession of the Rockefellers and friends, and that GMO is about population reduction, it doesn't take a great uh, mind to figure out that there might be something worth investigating in that assertion of mine. Well, in 1999, Monsanto announced that it was buying a tiny company in Mississippi, a very southern state, called Delta and Pineland. And there was a huge outcry. Organizations like Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, the NGOs that talk about ecological issues, called this Terminator technology because this little company in Mississippi had patented something called genetic use restriction technology, GERT. And in the popular media, it was dubbed Terminator, which I think is a very accurate term on the Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. And the idea of Terminator is that seeds are genetically modified or manipulated such that after one growing season, one harvest, those seeds will commit suicide such that the farmer must go back to Monsanto every planting season to buy new seeds. He can't take a share even of GMO seeds and replant them for the next harvest, which farmers have done around the world for 5,000 years. The ultimate in new serfdom for not only American farmers, world farmers. Well, in 1999, the uproar was such, and organizations like Greenpeace were managing to get a lot of press mileage on this, that the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, Gordon Conway, came to Monsanto and said, cool it guys, it's endangering the whole GMO project. Lay low, announce to the world that you're not going to buy this company. So Monsanto issued a statement that they were not going to acquire Delta and Pine in Mississippi, and that they were not going to commercialize Terminator technology. Well, Greenpeace breathed a sigh of relief, said victory for us, hooray, hooray. And the various NGOs moved on to other subjects and forgot about Terminator technology. Then come around, I believe it was 2007, when everybody had forgotten about Terminator, Monsanto issued a press release saying that they had bought a company in Mississippi that had very successful varieties of cotton. And the company was called Delta and Pineland. And they didn't say a word about uh, genetic use restriction technologies, which Delta and Pine had patented. They also didn't say that Delta and Pine had someone that they co-patented with. They had a partner who provided R&D support for developing Terminator technology. And that partner was the United States government, Department of Agriculture. So today, with barely a squeak from Greenpeace and company, or barely a peep of protest, Monsanto has that Terminator technology and they haven't said a word to the world about what they're doing with it. But you can believe it's nothing positive. So, the 
Then along comes the momentous year 2001, momentous for many reasons, but momentous in the field of GMO because a biotech company in San Diego, California named Epicete held a press conference and the president of Epicete, Douglas Hine, or Mitch Hine, I believe, announced to the press, mostly uh, industry press, ladies and gentlemen, we have made a major milestone in solving the problem of world overpopulation. He's pointed behind him and said, behind me is a greenhouse filled with spermicidal corn. Now, what did he mean? Spermicidal corn. Spermicidal mean it kills sperms. But whose sperms or what sperms? Human sperms. A man cannot conceive if he consumes this corn, his sperm will become infertile or whatever the term is. Well, that uh, announcement, that breakthrough was quickly hushed up. The company disappeared from the map. It was bought up by a North Carolina biotech company. But they did announce that they had made licensing agreements to market spermicidal corn technology through, I believe it was DuPont or Dow Chemical, worldwide. And not only that, the partner of Epicete in developing spermicidal GMO corn was again the United States government, the United States Department of Agriculture. The policy of the US Department of Agriculture has been for decades controlled by agribusiness. The giant cartel companies like Monsanto, Archer Daniel Midland and so, who wrote the World Trade Organization Agreement on Agriculture, among other things. So it should be no surprise that the uh, US Department of Agriculture is involved in such criminal activities. Well, US farmers were used as guinea pigs Daddy Bush had no problems with, with destroying the American food chain. He's a eugenicist too. And uh, his family's history going back to the Second World War was very, very sympathetic to the Third Reich of Adolf Hitler and co. The US government, according to one of the WikiLeaks cables that was pub made public, the US State Department is actively pushing and pressuring and arm twisting governments around the world to liberalize their laws and allow Monsanto GMO crops to be planted in their countries. Fortunately to this day, the European Union has by and large virtually blocked GMO, not because the European Commission is unfriendly to Monsanto, quite the opposite, unfortunately, not because the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, in Brussels, is scientifically opposed to GMO, which they should be if they were honest, they're corrupt, for the most part. But the population of Europe wants nothing to do with GMO polluting their food chain, and rightly so. The The uh, French University Caen uh, has a remarkable and morally courageous biology professor by the name of Gilles Eric Serralini. He, for a number of years, has been trying to analyze what's in Roundup and Roundup Ready. GMO seeds. It's difficult because Monsanto forbids independent scientists from using its seeds for analysis, research. If you do it and publish it, you'll be destroyed. 
with the legal theme of Monsanto, and they make it very clear. Well, Seralini is a clever fox, and he's a determined, courageous human being. He and his team managed to replicate the research protocol used by Monsanto to get its MON GMO corn certified by the European Commission in Brussels as the only one actively being commercially planted right now in Europe, and that in very little acreage. So Seralini secretly embarked on a two-year study of the effects on rats of a diet of GMO corn, Monsanto corn, compared with non-GMO rats. What he found, oh, and this, this is rather remarkable, 20 years after the commercialization, thanks to Father Bush and Monsanto, the commercialization of GMO, letting the genie out of the bottle in the human race, the first long-term, and this is crucial, the first long-term study of the effects of GMO on rats over the lifespan, average lifespan of rats of two years, was completed. It was reviewed by other scientific peers of Seralini and deemed scientifically valid and correct, the methodology and so forth, and published in the Journal of Food Toxicology, a leading journal at that time, a uh, scientific journal, respected journal, and it was released simultaneously onto the internet in September of 2013. That, oh, no, I'm sorry, September of 2012, one year before. That hit the world like a bombshell because what Seralini demonstrates in his article and documents over the two-year period is that he holds up pictures of the rats. You can see them. They're in, in uh, the German new edition of my book, Seeds of Destruction, Hotet Mot Livet. The rats had grotesque cancer tumors in every part of their body, like big balloons that they had swallowed. The mortality rates of GMO rats was four to 500 percent greater than non-GMO rats. The organ damage, especially to kidney and liver, of the GMO-fed rats were grotesque in the extreme. And he also tested rats with and without treating the GMO corn with Roundup weed killer. The ones with Roundup weed killers were off the charts in terms of, of uh, uh, side effects. And at that moment, it looked like the GMO project was dead in the water. The European Commission, which I'm often saying is, with the possible exception of today's United States Congress, perhaps the most corrupt body of political people in the world, the European Commission was caught in a dilemma. They had to say something. So what they said is, these are very serious allegations in this study of Seralini, we have given it to the European Food Safety Authority to investigate. Well, formally, that's what you would expect. What they didn't say is that the director of the GMO task force of EFSA works for a front organization financed by Monsanto and the industry, and that many of the members of that GMO task force have links to Monsanto. To call them corrupt is being charitable. And approximately one month later, they issued their findings of serious study of the Seralini article. They said there are scientific, uh, what was the term they used? Uh, not errors, they didn't say errors, they said it very carefully. Uh, irregularities in the Seralini study such that we have concluded there is no reason to withdraw our approval of Monsanto MON GMO corn in Europe. And they said, and this is the most incredible, we see no reason to consider this topic any further. In other words, rather than say, okay, here's a scientist who claims all these horrendous things, 
we recommend that we do not just one additional, maybe a hundred additional across the European Union in universities to make sure that we're not making a mistake. No. Case closed, ladies and gentlemen. And the dutiful mainstream media, which has in the last 20 or so years really become polluted with toxic waste, that stream of main media, they dutifully took the press release of the EFSA and the European Commission, and we didn't hear anything more, except this embarrassing article was still on the internet, and it was still in the magazine. Until one year later, last year, the magazine, the Journal of Food and Toxicology, announced that for the first time in their history, they were withdrawing a scientifically peer-reviewed article, and it was the Seralini article, taking it off their website because it was scientifically invalid. Well, it seems, as I dug further in, in researching what, what in the world is going on here, it seems that the journal hired a new vice president in that year, and that new vice president happened to come from a front organization of Monsanto. And he was made responsible for the scientific accuracy of articles about GMO. In other words, Monsanto used their money, used their influence to get this journal to retract a scientifically reviewed article so that the press, the mainstream media again, around the world carried the headline Seralini article, shocking development, withdrawn from scientific magazine for improper uh, methodology or something like that. So this gives an idea of what we're up against, but there is good news to this story, and I don't, don't want to stop this part of my remarks uh, leaving you in despair. There's very good news. I'm basically to my core optimistic as a human being about the future of life, even as grim as it might seem sometimes on this planet. I give the example of a single person. Most people say, well, what can I do? I'm hopeless against the power of Monsanto and the U.S. government and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There was a citizen's drive in the state of California, the largest state in the United States in population, to force food companies to label food if they have GMO above a certain, I think it was nine-tenths of one percent like here in Europe. Monsanto spent tens of millions of dollars and the other GMO companies to defeat this initiative, this ballot initiative. They succeeded, according to some reports, by manipulating the electronic voting machines. I can't judge that, but they, let's say they succeeded by a narrow margin. The referendum was defeated, and it came out that Monsanto had spent all this money. A housewife, a mother in, I believe it was in Idaho or Utah, a state without very many people, got so upset about this, she took it on herself. Nobody told her to do this. She wasn't with any NGO, so far as I know. She took it on herself to set up a Facebook page called March Against Monsanto. And she said, well, let's give a focus and call, I forget the date, May 13th or May 15th last year, some point in May, that there'll be protests against Monsanto. And just throw it out there. Well, that Facebook page went viral. And in May of last year, I believe it was in 52 different countries around the world, millions of ordinary citizens literally marched against Monsanto. Of course, the mainstream U.S. media, polluted with the toxic waste of GMO and Roundup as it is, did not cover this, or they claimed that it was a pathetic turnout. Well, this scared the living daylights out of Monsanto and company, because suddenly Monsanto had become a household word and not in a positive context. Since that time, I've noticed, I get called quite often, I live in Germany, have for a number of years, I get called quite often for interviews from 
all around, from Russia quite often, from Germany, from Europe, from England, United States. And after that march on Monsanto, a great majority of the calls for interviews had to do with my book, The Seeds of Destruction, to talk about what, what is this thing called Monsanto. Suddenly, people were beginning to wake up. So I think it's, it's far from a hopeless situation. I would suggest, however, something that I have been doing consciously and increasingly in my own personal life over the last several years, and that is each of us, like the mother in Utah or Idaho, have to think about how we can take responsibility for our lives and for the lives of our family, our friends, our children and their children, to take responsibility and not allow the hypnosis that we are inferior to Bill Gates or to David Rockefeller and their friends, because we're not, we're superior, we're human beings. Thank you. The interesting question about Monsanto is, who owns Monsanto? And one of the answers is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, our major shareholders in the stock of Monsanto. Monsanto has been one of a group of select corporations as a satellite of the Rockefeller faction in American politics going back to the First World War when they were producing chemicals for the US military, then more accurately called the War Department, not the Defense Department. And the, one of the directors on the board of Monsanto died recently about six, seven months ago I happened to come across the obituary, and his name was William Rockefeller. He was 103 years old, as I recall. So the Rockefeller family, Bill Gates. Bill Gates, by the way, his father was the president of Planned Parenthood, an organization that has been supported since the 1920s by the Rockefeller family. The founder of Planned Parenthood was Margaret Sanger, a committed eugenicist who during the Great Depression in the 1930s started a project and worked with a number of black Baptist ministers in Harlem, supposedly an education project, but in one of her private letters that was later made public she wrote, hopefully the black ministers don't catch on to the fact that this is about extermination of the black race or they won't cooperate with us. This is a father of, of Bill Gates. The Population Council that I mentioned that was set up by John D. Rockefeller III in 1953 sponsored eugenics, but they, as I say, they changed the name for political PR reasons. They cleaned up their act a little bit after the Nazi Holocaust uh, details were made public. And uh, they spent millions and tens of millions of dollars in finding ways to uh, prevent conception in women. The IUD was a Rockefeller invention or a Rockefeller-funded development. They did not directly finance the creation of the, what in German is called the anti-baby pill, the birth control pill, which went worldwide in the mid-60s. But once it did, they made sure it was widely adopted. But their aim was to drastically reduce the birth rate of lower class people, as they called it, inferior people. Blacks in America, uh, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, and then around the world. It was the Rockefellers 
who convinced Deng Xiaoping in the late 1970s, the one who opened up China to the West, socialist market economy, that China should adopt a one-child policy. It's a demogra demographic catastrophe today, and I've been to China over the last years uh, something like 10 times and spoken at universities uh, east, west, north, and south. And when you start as a government playing around with the birth rates of your population, you're doing something that no government should be involved in, in my view. That's a personal human decision of the families involved. But far from a overpopulation in our planet today of human beings, if you look at the real demographics at the birth rates and project that out 30 to 50 years, we are facing a crisis in underpopulation in the very near future, 25, 35 years out. The birth rates across Europe are catastrophically below zero reproduction or neutral steady state, maintaining the population. In Germany, it's a disaster. Already, Germany is becoming one of Europe's largest old folks' home. You walk down the streets and all you see are old people with walkers. Not that I have anything against people using walkers. But uh, the vitality, the, the younger generation is it's like you have a garden hose and you, you put a pair of pliers to the middle of it and stop it. The flow is, is not there, and the same across Europe. The birth rate, even in Africa, which is held up as the horror story of overpopulation by people in, in Europe and the United States, has dropped to a level of something like 2.46 children per childbearing age woman. And that is dangerously close to the, I believe it's 2.3 level, which is considered zero population growth, zero growth. So there is no part of this planet where we are having out of control growth of the human population. And that is gonna have enormous consequences. But people like Ted Turner, Bill Gates, George Soros, David Rockefeller, think that that's quite fine if we have several billion people less on this planet. Ted Turner even gave an interview to a Christian fundamentalist magazine back in the 90s, the founder of CNN, where he said, I would be more than happy in a world with 225 million people. Huh. Where is he gonna get his billions from? So, these people are in no way inferior to us normal human beings. In fact, they're psychopathic in their hatred for humanity, I would maintain, and their hatred for themselves, ultimately. I was told by someone who had, uh, had, this, had an exposure to extremely wealthy people, a financial person, and he was told by uh, the product of one of these extremely wealthy billionaire homes, in France, I believe it was, that the children of these ultra-rich families are bred in a certain way, like you breed horses. The minute they come out of the womb of the mother, they're taken from the mother. There's no possibility for the mother to bond with her newborn infant in a loving way. They're given to a wet nurse. They're raised by nannies surrogate mothers, such that there's no human love in their family between the child and the parents. I can identify with this personally because I grew up in such a family, not of oligarchs or billionaires, but where that element was lacking, and that is an extremely difficult thing to cope with. The idea of these people is to turn us into, through genetic manipulation and other means, to turn us into a human species of worker ants or drones or zombies who have barely the strength to do a certain quantum of work that they want from us. The rest will be allowed to die off because they have technology that can do many of these things, robots 
we don't need pilots anymore. We have uh, video games in, in Las Vegas that send drones into Pakistan or Africa or wherever you want it and uh, just bomb anyone they want to bomb. Blow them off the face of the earth. So these are very sick people. If we had adequate diagnoses and uh, mental institutions, they would be put out of society's harm permanently because the chances of rehabilitation uh, they've demonstrated are, are fairly remote. But we don't have courts of real justice anymore. We don't have legal institutions that uh, uh, would restrain these people. They've managed to buy their way into unrestrained uh, power, certainly in the United States. Why should David Rockefeller be allowed to be exempt from an inheritance tax, to have tax-exempt foundations, and we get taxed to the death by our governments? What's going on here? I read this morning in the Financial Times that a UN study has concluded there are something like $2.1 trillion of profits of U.S. multinationals, including General Electric and I think uh, Apple and American company, the drug, drug company, $2.1 trillion of profits that normally would be taxed by the bankrupt U.S. government, except for the fact that the tax laws have been modified to allow them to keep that profit offshore. So these are indications. We've let this happen. We've let things happen in every country that I'm familiar with, from Russia to China to Sweden to Germany to the United States. And I think we can let it be reversed if we are determined to. And I like to say, as an optimistic point at this point, there are only two extremes. These psychopathic elites, David Rockefeller, Bill Gates, George Soros, by the way, they're all members of the same club. They founded it in, I think it was 2009, in New York City at the Rockefeller University. It's called the Good Club. And the agenda of the Good Club, which is not very good people, is world population reduction. It's the aim of Bill Gates' vaccination programs for Africa. It's the aim of Bill Gates' sponsoring of the Green Revolution in Africa, which is nothing other than a cover to bring Monsanto GMO seeds to Africa. It's the agenda of David Rockefeller and everything he's done since his birth, killing inferior human beings, as he sees it. And the antidote to that is something they are absolutely terrified because they have never experienced it in their own lives, and that is love. The unconditional love of a mother for a handicapped child, the love of a husband and wife or partners in a relationship, the love for family, the love for friends. The Greeks broke it down into different qualities of love, and I think that's a very useful way to think about it. But the emotion of love, it's a, an energetic resonance, and when we resonate that emotion, it touches something in other human beings. It doesn't necessarily mean having sex with everyone you meet. That was the counterculture in 1968. But it means loving what's human in us all, the divine spark of creativity that defines the difference between human beings and animals. Do you know anything about the seed port in Svalbard? Oh, yes. <laughs> Several years ago, there was an article in BBC News that caught my eye called the Doomsday Seed Vault. And it was a very happy-go-lucky, joking kind of article that the government of Norway, together with several private foundations, up on Svalbard, this uh, piece of rock near the Arctic Circle, or above the Arctic Circle, actually, was the site 
for a multi-million dollar nuclear bomb-proof vault that would have a higher security than the Federal Reserve gold vaults at Fort Knox, where there is no gold, I'm told. <laughs> uh, and this seed vault would store every known seed on the planet. And then I did some research and I found that the foundations who are sponsoring this project in uh, uh, the Arctic Circle included, guess who? Rockefeller Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Syngenta Corporation of Basel, Switzerland, a GMO, one of the four horsemen of the GMO apocalypse, as I call them. And I believe it was DuPont or Dow, I forget. So what are these people doing sponsoring a collection of all the seeds on the planet? This gets really freaky. I can only speculate because I don't have tape recordings like the Ukrainian intelligence or the Russian intelligence has of Victoria Newland and the ambassador, U.S. ambassador, talking about their coup d'etat. But I can only speculate they're up to no good in terms of the human race, given what they're doing. But that's all I can say about it. Those seeds, oh, I'll give another uh, footnote to that. When Bush and Cheney launched the war against Iraq and Saddam Hussein in 2003, March, one of the first targets was one of the world's most valuable seed banks for varieties, organic varieties of wheat. Mesopotamia, the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, was the cradle from which agriculture, human agriculture, was born. The wheat varieties kept in that seed vault, by the way, the name of the seed vault uh, location was Abu Ghraib, which later became infamous as a CIA torture chamber. That seed vault disappeared from the face of the earth. Let's say roughly five to seven percent that's left of the conventional soybeans crops that are out there in the entire world. Do they end up in Europe without any labels? No. no. There's a loophole in the labeling law of the EU as a result of the lobbying by Archer Daniel Midland, Cargill, and Monsanto. The loophole is imported soybeans that are GMO are not required to be labeled. because Monsanto and the agribusiness lobby corrupted EU politicians. That's the only reason. Import of GMO soybean and corn in the form of animal feed or soybeans for consumption. China, by the way, they don't allow yet. There's some politicians who have been corrupted, but they still don't allow. Uh, perhaps the woman here can comment more concretely on this. Uh, they don't allow commercial growing of soy, GMO soybeans in China yet. There's illegal growing, but uh, that's another question. The Chinese import 61% of soybeans that are consumed in China, and they consume a lot of soybeans in their diet, and it's all GMO. It's a loophole again. The farmers in uh, America know everything about GMO and uh, they don't like it. Why don't they turn to the ecological farming? What, what is uh, stopping them? It's, it's not so easy because the fields have been contaminated with Roundup and these glyphosate-based uh, chemical poisons. It takes about seven years to get that out of your soil if you're a farmer. And you have license agreements with Monsanto to buy those seeds. Monsanto is going around the world buying up all independent seed companies, proprietary seed companies. Even if they don't make them GMO, they control the seeds. 
So you're dealing with organized crime that uh, masquerades as a legitimate corporation when you're dealing with Monsanto and the GMO lobby. The farmers are trapped. Now they have super weeds because Roundup, well, nature is a devilish thing. The so-called weeds have developed resistance to Roundup. So farmers find after several planting seasons with Roundup that super weeds develop which choke out everything and don't react to Roundup. They're immune. So farmers have to use more chemicals, more toxins on, the, on their uh, crops just to survive. And some of them can't even rescue the soybeans. So it's a, a Frankenstein monster. And uh, I was wondering, do you know if uh, fermentation will actually reduce problems for the GMOs? I mean, uh, so, some people have claimed this. Uh, I have a fascinating book uh, that a friend gave me who was in Brazil, uh, uh, where there's a strong anti-GMO movement, but it's a resistance movement at this point. The government caved in about six years ago. They banned GMO until then, but uh, he did a book on the history of soy beans. And his conclusion, he has quite convincing arguments, is that soybeans in any form are unfit for human or animal consumption. And he traces through the steps by which in the US, you know, gradually after World War II, uh, the soybean lobby began to find arguments for, uh, you know, margarine instead of butter because of the wartime rationing and so forth that were made with soy oil and things like this. But uh, he has some convincing, I thought, non-GMO soybeans, maybe that's okay, and I used to drink non-GMO soy milk with my muesli and thinking I'm really getting healthy. And then, it's interesting, Provamel, the company that uh, markets this in Germany, and they have prominently on their label, no GMO. About uh, nine or 10 months ago, I went to get a refill, and I happened to look for that no GMO label, and there was no no GMO in statement on the label anymore. They weren't even promising that it was GMO free. And I mentioned that to the owner of this uh, health food store where I was buying it. And I think if she had had the ability, she would have thrown me out on the sidewalk that second. She didn't want to hear that because that's one of the biggest sellers for health food. GMO, I mean, soya as an alternative for protein. We don't need it. Cows don't either. I read that the uh, uh, bacteria which they use, which they put into the, uh, well, they take the genes from the bacillus uh, Turingus, yeah. and put it into core, to yeah. BT core. Yeah. And I've heard rumors that uh, somehow uh, those genes uh, end up in your intestines and they can interact with the local uh, bacteria in your intestines and actually reprogram them to, uh, to produce BT toxin in your intestines. Do you know anything about that? Have you heard any verification of that? I don't, and I'm not a biologist, but uh, I've read reports of things that it does in the stomach of cows, and it's, it's horrendous. I mean, we, the problem is there's no government in this world that's supporting independent testing of all these things. We let the genie out of the bottle. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush Sr. in 1992, as I mentioned, and because of the pressure of the United States on the world, the European Union has refused to have independent testing. Monsanto refuses to give the seeds up for such testing. Yeah, talking about all this, other countries. I think I saw the other day, was it out here or whatever it was, that uh, in Russia, Putin would not allow the GMO uh, in Russia. Do you know anything about Because it's such a big, big country with Russia, Russia, and I've been there many times, uh, it's very dear to my heart. Uh, I was there in July of 2013 and did interviews with a number of media and organizations that were fighting to keep GMO from Russia. At that point they were pessimistic, they said the government, after the WTO 
entry of Russia, World Trade Organization, uh, things look very black. And scientists who do independent studies on rats about GMO feeding, uh, one doctor named Ernakova, whom I, I know personally, very courageous woman, had their funding grants cut off under pressure from Monsanto and the U.S. State uh, Embassy. Uh, since the attacks on Russia around Ukraine, Ukraine was a Pentagon neoconservative coup d'etat against a democratically elected government, corrupt or non-corrupt, Yanukovych was democratically elected. Uh, this crowd of neo-Nazis and gangsters who are uh, self-appointed as the government of Ukraine now were put in there by the United States, neoconservatives, the CIA and, and the Pentagon, or a faction of it. Victoria Nuland is a neoconservative. She was the aide to Dick Cheney before Bush made her ambassador to NATO. And Hillary Clinton, who was a Bush family friend going back decades, made her the State Department spokesman and later she became the Assistant Secretary for Europe. But uh, the, mm, I got involved on in the emotions that I feel for Ukraine and lost, lost my thread. What, what was the point I made before I did that? Oh, yes, I, I know, I know, RT. Yeah. So as a result of the almost open war between the West, the EU, and, and uh, Russia, the government has declared that there will be no imports of GMO allowed in Russia. Hooray, bravo. That's a wonderful example. I hope other countries follow, whatever the reason was that uh, Putin and Medvedev, uh, Medvedev under the as Prime Minister has responsibility for agriculture. So this, this seems to be genuine. Have you yourself been threatened by this so-called elite by writing these books and uh, talking about other things? Yeah. yeah? Yeah. I don't know how to work this water thing here. I'll answer you in a second. Oh, here. Complicated Swedish technology. <laughs> for a dumb American, it's not so easy. Uh, in April 2008, I wrote a, an article on the riots in Tibet in China and submitted it to a website in Canada called Global Research. Perhaps some of you know it. And the next day I caught a plane to Beijing for my first invitation to visit China and give talks about my book on oil. And in that article, I mentioned a foundation in Tibet financed with money of George Soros called the Trace Foundation. And in one half of a sentence, I listed the U.S. government financed NGOs that were active in the Tibetan riots and protests of the Dalai Lama movement, the Tibetan independence movement, and so forth. And I said, not only the National Endowment for Democracy, the CIA's Freedom House, and uh, the da 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 da, also the Foundation, Trace Foundation, financed with the money of billionaire George Soros, and run by his daughter. And I returned from China with a very unfriendly letter in my mailbox, from the law firm of George Soros about this article. Unknown to me, it had been picked up while I was in China, translated by someone in Vancouver, British Columbia, into Chinese, into Mandarin, and sent to a newspaper, I think first in Hong Kong, I'm not sure. But from there, it got picked up by China Daily, Xinhua, the state government news agency, and picked up by almost every paper in China my little article with my name. And word got back to Soros and his people that this was in China. So his law firm wrote to me a letter, very, very ugly letter, 
I looked at the client list of uh, this law firm, and it included David Rockefeller, it included Chase Manhattan Bank, of course, Goldman Sachs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the head of the law firm was Soros's personal lawyer, Zabel, uh, who bragged in a newspaper article, because I thought I'd better find out who these people are, that he had successfully handled George Soros's divorce from his ex-wife, and she only got away with $80 million of his billions. Well, he, uh, ostensibly the daughter, but uh, I believe it was George Soros, went through three different law firms before they found one morally corrupt enough to pursue this harassment case, took me to court in Germany where my website is registered, in Hamburg where the uh, journalistic judges are notorious for siding with the power interests against free journalists like myself. And at the time, I'd never had such a thing, so I started getting a little bit nervous. I, you know, I'm up against some pretty ugly people here. And I asked a friend of mine, do you know a lawyer, <laughs> a good lawyer? And this is uh, serendipity. He said, actually, I do. And he put me in contact with this friend of his. The friend came on a Sunday morning to his restaurant, uh, Karim's restaurant in Wiesbaden, where I live. And I told him the details of what had happened. He said, I'm going to help you. I'm an American. I consult to the biggest law firms in, in Germany. But uh, one of my good uh, clients happens to be one of the best lawyers in Germany. And he studied at the University of Texas, where I did. I'm going to ask him if he'll handle your case, which he did. And this lawyer, Christoph, thought, well, it's just a matter of a lawyer's letter, head letter to say my client has withdrawn, retracted the, the article from his website and issued a statement of apology. Uh, and he thought that would be it, you know, five minutes work. It dragged on for three years. It went into the appeals court in Hamburg. Before the appeals, on, on the lower level court, the judge was personal friends with Soros's lawyer and uh, issued a ruling that uh, while he had to at least obey the rough bounds of, of legality in German law, it's not that bad yet in Germany, but it's getting there. Uh, he nailed me on the, the most minor point by hair splitting and we went to appeal and on appeal uh, they were forced to drop it but not before I had to spend thousands of euros in my legal defense. So, yes, I have, and since then I've published three books in China. So, or four.